and our presenter is Peter Gorovich, the founding, direct, founding dean of the School of Global Policy and Strategy, known as GPS. He served in that role from 1986 to 1998, and he is a distinguished professor emeritus of political science at UC San Diego. He is an expert on international relations and comparative politics, specializing in political economy with a particular focus on international trade and economic globalization, trade disputes, regulatory systems, and corporate governance, which we will be hearing about today. He has written numerous books and articles on political power, shareholder reforms, unions, and economic crisis. His most recent book, The Credibility of Transnational NGOs When Virtue is Not Enough, with David Lake and Janice Grossstein, uh, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2012. He co-edited the journal International Organization from 1996 to 2001 and published Political Power and C Corporate Control, The New Global Politics of Corporate Governance and Politics in Hard Times, Comparative Responses to International Crises. Other publications deal with US-Japan relations, international relations after the Cold War, Europe and France. And of course, he was already awarded the uh, Roger Ravel Medal in 2014. Please join me in welcoming our special guest, Peter Gorovich. Okay, so now I have to make a roll. Okay, so here's my question. Let me speed it up. Why do market economies differ and why? Now, let me try to explain my thought a minute. In the 1980s, we had a flood of high quality Japanese, German auto and electronic products flooding into the US and US firms having trouble adapting. And we had many cases of, of, uh, of products being developed here and then the production shipped overseas. And in seeking answers, uh, the major obstacle to US adaptation it struck me that it was not just technology, not that we had major obstacles to inventing things. We we're doing a great job inventing things, but it seems to me the obstacle had to do with process systems. We had trouble with production processes. One phrase that many of you are familiar with is just in time, since that phrase is reappearing these days in the supply chain crisis. And as I was studying this, I was asking myself, why are we having trouble adapting to these things? I thought the answer, I'm going to use the Colombo technique of uh, where he gives you the answer in the beginning and then he tells you how he got there. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Your Honor, the answer is, in my opinion, the answer to me was our corporate governance system made it difficult for us to adopt adaptations and various process systems of how to alter our systems of manufacturing and product development and change to uh, translate uh, our very great product uh, development and research into very good manufacturing systems. I thought that the dilemma lay with corporate governance, that is the distribution of power in the firm, who has the authority to decide on resources, and that's what the answer was. I'm gonna give you my trajectory of how I got to that answer. My first book was on, uh, uh, the first book I, I published was on French institutions, Paris and the provinces, enough on that. My second book was called Politics and Hard Times, why the US, UK, France, Germany, and Sweden differed in the way they handled big shocks in the world economy in three historical periods. And that was, that's been very useful to try to make sense out of what's going on in the world today. And it was in the process of doing that, I remember I published a paper and there's a first couple sentences in that paper have over the years attracted a lot of attention. I have colleagues who still cite the second sentence in there. So I'll show it to you. The second sentence is, so social scientists who enjoy comparisons, happiness is finding a force or event which affects a number of societies at the same time. Like test tube solutions that respond differently to the same reagent, these societies reveal their characters and divergent responses to the same stimulus. So I compared how countries responded to the same uh, international economic crises in three historical periods. 
And guess what? We're having similar reactions these days, and that's been quite interesting. Now, the interesting thing that led that particular uh, project led to a book called Politics in Hard Times. And uh, I would say in modesty that that is the book that probably I'm the most well known in my profession for. Um, and I looked at how countries either broke with orthodoxy to try Keynesianism as opposed to remaining a neoclassical path or in breaking an alternative with state intervention, massive state intervention in the economy. And it was in doing that book that I became more and more aware of this issue of uh, how the interesting question to me as a comparative political economy person was how capitalisms differed from each other, capitalism versus capitalism. Uh, this question that I started out talking to you was how Japan and Germany were differing so much from the United States, what these conflicts were about, and then new things were happening in, in the world. The four tigers, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong were emerging. China was starting to experience sensational growth and all over Latin America, significant growth was occurring and the US was having trouble uh, responding to that. I got involved in an interesting project with one of my colleagues. We went around the world. Sloan Foundation asked us to look at the hard disk drive industry. Why was having been invented here? Why was manufacturing assembly going to Singapore, China, Thailand, Ireland? I got the assignment of going to Ireland, which is a lot of fun of uh, going around and interviewing them and trying to understand what were they doing that was causing uh, manufacturing to locate there. Now, it was about this time in the 1980s, which the idea of creating our School of International Affairs came about. Chancellor Atkinson asked me to chair this committee. Chancellor Atkinson and president of the university, Gardner, had the idea of support of this idea. And that is the context, the geopolitical context in which our school was created. And that fit my intellectual interest quite a lot of trying to explain this differential growth and these different changes and some of the interesting things that lead to modern inequality. Now, there were no ends of answers provided to why these things were happening in the world. The world is full of answers to big questions. Culture, like Confucianism, institutions, Germany and Japan were state-led economies. The US did not have an industrial economic policy. Decentralized banking system, decision-making, fragmented political process in the US. Cold War, we spent too much on defense. Um, some of you may remember this great, big, wonderful book by Jared Diamond, Guns, Germs, and Steel, but it cannot explain variance within these major groups. And this was, to me, an interesting example of variance within those groups. And then there was a very big argument on legal family that I will not take you down today unless you ask me. Um, so I, you know, the culture argument was very powerful. We, I, I would encounter many, many people who believe that they would say, well, the reason that Asia is doing so well, the four, the, the four tigers are doing so well is their Confucian. And to somebody like me in graduate school, gone graduate school in political science, this was a very startling uh, interpretation because in, in the 60s, if you were interested in, one of the questions is why was Asia doing so badly? Why was China doing so badly? In those days, it was very poor, if you will recall. A standard answer was Confucianism. Confucianism uh, caused you to defer too much to authority, and there was no way that they were going to bring about change and innovation and, and aggressive competition. This was a, a doctrine that was against that. And so it was strange that 30 years later, now that they were growing like crazy, that the same argument was being used to explain the opposite. That is not, a, in my field, that is not a popular answer uh, an interpretation. And one of the things that uh, there are these natural experiments that, uh, that show is this, where you have uh, countries that share the same culture, but have very strongly different outcomes. North Korea, South Korea, East Germany, West Germany, the several Chinas of the, the People's Republic of China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, all Chinese societies in some ways have had very, very different economic, political and economic experiences. And so that is not an argument which has been very popular in, uh, in political science. So my field was dominated by the institutions and politics argument, that, that the arguments that dominated in, uh, when I was starting to look at this looked at the role of the state. Germany and Japan were held up as places where the state played an active role coordinating amongst economic institutions 
the state and the, and the firm is coordinated with each other. This was the so-called Asian model, except that Germany also did it. And so it was an argument, they did it, we didn't, and that was our problem. And as I read more and more about this, there seemed to be something not quite right about that argument. Uh, I didn't think, I thought it left some important things out. And I read some books that impressed me a great deal. I don't know if any of you remember these books, but in particular, a book by James Womack, The Machine That Changed the World, and another book by David Halberstam, The Reckoning. But in particular, The Machine That Changed the World was a study by uh, some people at MIT, of what Womack was the writer, but the project was led at MIT, that studied the auto industry in tremendous detail. And what they concluded was that what made Japanese auto industry doing particularly well were what I call at the beginning of the talk, these process uh, innovations, not technological innovations. It was uh, uh, just in time business practices combined with networking. This idea that you, just in time to, to remind you what that is, is that means that you only keep enough inventory as you're gonna need right away. You don't accumulate tons of inventory. You only have a little bit. And as you see yourself running low, you order some more. And But there's another thing that it allows you to do and with Toyota, which pioneered this, is the workers, if they got picked up a part to put onto the, on the assembly line, if they found a defect in it, they could pull a cord to stop the assembly line until the, the defects in this thing were analyzed and understood because they weren't gonna order a resupply of defective parts. They were gonna go back and figure out what was defective. That part should not be arriving defective because they didn't wanna put on defective parts which then had to go be back and fixed and, re fixed and rework yards. They wanted to solve the problem and fix it. So just in time was combined with a networking practice of analyzing and working out mistakes so that you were only resupplying corrected parts. And that was very fascinating because that meant that it was not only just in time, but a way of interconnecting the pieces of the production system. Now, if you think about that, that's really interesting. That creates an interesting codependent relationship of the parts of the manufacturing to each other. How are you gonna relate the part supplier to the parent manufacturer because they're becoming dependent on each other. This creates what's called the holdup problem. If I make brakes for Toyota and I enter into a contract with Toyota, I'm now dependent on Toyota to buy my brakes. And, and Toyota wants the brakes to be of a particular way to fit their specification. So Toyota is only has to share technology. Well, imagine sharing the technology with a part supplier that they don't own they are risk being taken advantage of. So there's a codependence there and you have to work out a mechanism of how do you work out this mutual codependence. I'm not gonna invest in breaks unless you buy a lot of them, but, uh, and I, uh, so I have to be willing to buy them. How do we, how do we handle this? Well, the, what GM did, GM had complete vertical integration. GM and the American system was, you integrate within the firm all the pieces in one firm. And uh, that had a very big advantage. You minimize this risk. You could share the technology without any risk that anybody takes advantage of everybody else, but you also get the very risk of bloated costs. You're, you're, since you're, your pieces of your firm are not in any kind of market competition, you have no real no, way of knowing what the market cost of these things. So your firm has a risk of getting bloated. What did the, how, did, how did Toyota solve this problem? Toyota solved this in a networking system where the pieces of this firm were also, they supplied Toyota, but they were also in other ways in market competition for other pieces. And so how did they solve that? Well, there's the interesting part of it. They solved that by mutually owning pieces of each other. And they solved it in, in, well, there are a lot of words for it. One is the Keiretsu. They owned enough pieces of each other that none of them would go away. They would some contract to each other, but they had interlocking co-ownership so that they were all locked into the same system. So that fascinated me. And I read, I read more and more and more of these things. And I now understood, okay, 
that's what they're doing there. That's why they're having this constant process of innovation and tech and change. And they're squeezing the defects out of the cars and they're getting cars and all kinds of these things that don't have full of mistakes. So I thought, well, if they do that, why aren't they doing this in the United States and in the UK? Why don't we do that? I mean, it's not, it's not, what's the joke? It's not brain surgery or whatever. Uh, well, that could be done here. Why isn't it happening here? Well, there are some just-in-time systems like that, but why isn't it more pervasive? And the more I read about it, the more I realized that there are barriers to this in the United States. There are a lot of rules that prevent that kind of networking relationship. And one of them is that American uh, antitrust law and a lot of other rules, this allow this as monopolistic. Here's an example of this. DuPont was one of, DuPont is an older company than GM. And DuPont was one of the companies that in the classic uh, Japanese and German matter, it was one of the companies that helped develop GM and it invested in GM. And so at a certain point, it owned 23% of GM. 1961, the Supreme Court came along and said, well, you have to sell your share because you now have too dominant a position in the plastics chemicals market and uh, you're a monopoly, you've got to get rid of it. Well, that is, um, uh, wouldn't happen in Japan and, and Germany because they would say, no, 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 this is absolutely a vital part of how our system works. So as I wanted to study what, what made that happen, why did we, the United States come to the point where what was conceived as a very vital competitive practice in other places was seen as, as uh, absolutely unacceptable to us. And remember, I'm a political, you're talking to a political scientist here. So I'm giving you a very sharply political scientist perspective on all this stuff. My model of the world is you see a barrier, it's likely to have been caused by politics because it's politics which cause policies, laws, and regulations and court decisions. Court decisions are not some autonomous little thing called courts, which are taught in law schools as an autonomous thing, or economics, which are taught as an autonomous universe or whatever. They are shaped by politics, which are which is what shapes the laws, the regulations, and of course courts. Fortunately, these days, the Supreme Court, the one good thing to me about the way the Supreme Court is these days, that it's not as difficult as it used to be. To persuade people that courts are political, it's very obvious to everybody that courts are political. So um, I became interested in that, and it led to the one trouble with screen sharing. You can, can you see me? Yes, you can see me. So that's right, you can see me. All right. This was politics and hard times. Uh, this was the first book. I have to hold up the first book because I love the cover. I found this this book on Paris and the provinces, and I found this cover when I was working on it in a Japanese magazine and I got permission to reproduce it. This was the politics and hard times. This is the one that I became the most well known for and it's been published in several languages and um, dull cover, but what the heck. So this is, um, this stuff that I'm not talking to you about became, um, I combined in the work, this I wrote my co-author Jim Shin, Political Power and Corporate Control. So. What I discovered in reading on this was that once, you know, in the late 19th century, that the U.S. looked a lot more like Japan and Germany. Our, the, the structure, the relationship of all these firms to each other we looked a lot like them. We had, I mean, those of you who went to school here will remember reading these things, the big trusts, J.P. Morgan, the fight in the late 19th century and early 20th century against the big trust. J.P. Morgan owned big chunks of different firms, coordinated them. You had the Carnegie's, the Rockefeller's, all this kind of thing. And then what happens is you have, you go through a period over many years of a big fight against that system. And gradually one by one, there was a, a piece of, reg, of regulatory changes that started to fight against them, of which one of the earliest Interstate Commerce Act, 1880s, I listed them on the screen here for you. I won't read them all, but one act bans railroad price fixing. Another is Antitrust Act, 1890, expanded in 1914. A very big one was the Supreme Court of 1905, which is a breakup of the Rockefeller thing of Standard Oil. Remember, you know, when, when that was, when the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 was passed, it wasn't obvious to everybody how it would be enforced. 
And so that the Supreme Court actually, a pretty conservative Supreme Court, actually enforced this against something as prominent as the Rockefellers was really uh, very startling. And then, of course, there was the, uh, you know, how long would it take to actually have it carried out? Um, and so on. So these things started to actually get carried out. And you might ask, you know, why do these things, what's the politics behind that? I've actually, as a political scientist, I, I regard this as a failure. I've just listed and given you a political, uh, a list of uh, pieces of legislation, but I've not actually said anything to you about the politics behind that legislation. What made all of that possible? I would say what made it possible that you had a burst of populist and progressive sen sentiment. Now, some of you may remember this as well, you may remember reading about uh, William Jennings Bryan and the Cross of Gold speech and the election of uh, 1896. Some of you may know this book about what's the matter with Kansas, a very, very popular, very well-known book with, which explores why the people of Kansas, the logic of that book is why the people of Kansas, so many things are done which hurt them economically and yet they go ahead and they vote for the people who are hurting them economics I read that book, I thought it was an interesting book, but there was one thing about that book that made me very upset as a political science history person. There's not a mention anywhere in the entire book about William Jennings Bryan and the Cross of Gold speech. And the fact that a hundred years ago, at that time, these farmers were amongst the, were, were very angry supporters of the progressive movement. And there was an economic, political economy to that they were upset because they thought, you remember that railroad regulation I'm talking about? They were very upset because they thought that the Eastern industrial banking and railroad interests were ripping them off with regulated, manipulated railroad pricing and, and uh, industrial products, high tariffs, a whole bunch of other things. And William Jennings Bryan was a leader, was a high religious guy. Remember, he's the Scopes trial guy. He's a, he's a, a was a militantly religious person, but he was also the leader of the progressive movement. Well, these are people are very, uh, are very much in favor of regulation of the trusts, breaking up the trusts and all that. You had a big progressive movement, which is in favor of all this, and you had some significant labor support. So you had a farmer labor, labor middle class alliance with some business support, uh, that that's key ingredients of progressive reform in the United States happens when you have that kind of, uh, of more complicated alliance that's in favor of these things. Well, that's the group what gets together and has gotten some things done that have changed the American system over the years. That's also the group of people that got together and got a lot of the New Deal through. And uh, the Security and Exchange Act of 1934 continues what I've been talking about in changing the rules and regulations of the corporate governance system and have changed the corporate governance system so that it is not the way it was uh, at the end of the 19th century. So this is kind of the center point. My point is that what happens in the United States is that the US develops a corporate governance system which looks like this, a small, many, 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 uh, small stockholders. They may not be small, but they're diffuse. You do not have large numbers. Of, uh, uh, you don't have shareholders that own a huge chunk of the firm. They elect the board of directors and the board of directors supervises the managers. Okay, that's in sharp contrast with the European model, which looks like that. You have dominant blockholders. You have a dominant, you have a share, uh, a dominant stockholder who owns a sufficiently large number of shares to be able to put representatives on the board of directors and they interact directly with the senior managers through their privileged position on the board of directors. There are small stockholders, but they have no particular pride of place. They are, mar they are marginal to the running of the firm. And so, this whole big literature is developed on shareholder versus stakeholder models of, of the firm. Uh, and, uh, and the American model is a diffuse shareholder model as opposed to the concentrated um, uh, stakeholder, concentrated shareholder or stakeholder model. I mean, it's more complicated than that because a stakeholder could be people other than shareholder. The stakeholder model 
contains this idea that there are more people involved in running the firm than just shareholders. There's a big conflict. Who, who, in whose interest is the firm? Is the firm only in the interest of the shareholder? That is an idea which has emerged in business schools and in, uh, in finance theory and all that, really only in the last 50 years, amazingly enough, there's all kinds of people writing articles that saying the real owner of the firm is the shareholder and no one else has a right to have any interest in it, which leaves out employees. Uh, it really le- leaves out the, the workers, it leaves out uh, the suppliers, the distributors, the every everybody else, the community. And there's a lot of people who don't, uh, who argue against that. But the, for my purposes, the, the important thing is, um, is that this idea of the diffuse shareholder model is what pre- pre- prevailed in the United States. And therefore the United States developed a system where the rules and regulations developed to create protections for the the minority shareholder against the black holders. Okay, now that, and this, so in our book, in in this book, this book is based upon this idea, this is what, this is impossible for you to read, so I won't even try, but I'll tell you what this diagram says. What this diagram is built upon the idea that where minority shareholders are strong, you get diffusion of shareholding. But where minority shareholder protections are weak, you have block holding. Because if somebody is not willing to become a minority shareholder in a system where there are weak protections of minority shareholders, if the big block holder can rip you off, you're unwilling to be a minority shareholder. I mean, that's the simple premise. It's more complicated, but that's a simple premise. So this is a diagram which rates countries by their degree of minority shareholder protection on four different dimensions and then rates the countries. So it tries it tries to do that. We have all kinds of diagrams and statistics all over there to show how well that correlates. And there's a, a tremendous amount of literature which explores that. I am not gonna try to go over that argument with you, but that is the argument which goes on to this very day. People argue a lot about these different interpretations so if I to say that what's interesting is the, um, the uh, these different arguments have, e- each of these systems has advantages and disadvantages. The minority shareholder system, the diffuse shareholder system does gives you a lot of protection for minority shareholders. And big American uh, investing firms go all around the world trying to encourage firms all over the place um, to, to promote that those things in order to make it possible to make it worth them investing. So there are a lot of advantages of that. There are disadvantages to it. The disadvantages to it is that it starts to produce, um, uh, it breaks up the firm, actually, the interest in the firm. Uh, the various participants in the firm start to have less and less stake in its preservation. Whereas the block holding system is essentially a corporatist system. Everybody, every, all the different participants, all the different stakeholders in the firm are protected in some way or another. All the workers, the middle management, the measure, the members of the supply chain, it is a system which preserves existing relationships. So it's not an accident that it correlates very well with this German and Japanese system that I was telling you about earlier which preserves the stability of relationships in a situation of continuous uh, process improvement. So let me, uh, I don't have lots of time remaining, but let me quickly go over a few points about what's been going on in the last bunch of years since we published the book. We, uh, some important things have changed. We uh, wrote a paper a couple of year, a couple of years ago looking at the important things that have changed in the system when we published a paper that came out last year. And uh, I wanna just mention a couple of those, but then talk more about the politics of the battle over the reforms on all this. Uh, stupendous growth of sovereign wealth funds about which we know nothing is known about what the sovereign wealth funds do with the money because they're controlled by foreign governments. The foreign governments are not obligated to tell us anything and they don't. There's more and more 
shares owned by private investors who aren't obligated to tell us anything and they don't. There are more and more private companies who own shares and they're not obligated to tell us anything and they don't. At the same time, there's a tremendous growth in institutional investors of various kinds who own shares. And that's a really very interesting phenomenon. They do tell us more about what they do with their ownership because there are rules that require them to do that. That was one of the effects of the Dodd-Frank reform. So one of the effects is that there's less capital as a percentage of total invested capital, there's less of them in public countries where minority shelter protections obtain, but there might be more information known about what's in them. Let me look at the politics and current trends in the US on, on this kind of thing. Here's a couple of interesting things that have happened. A couple of years ago, the Business Roundtable, which is the hugely important um, organization of the presidents and the CEOs of big firms, made a lot of waves by announcing that it was a, a coming out in favor of a stakeholder primacy doctrine instead of a shareholder primacy doctrine. This made a lot of waves because the shareholder primacy doctrine had been dominating American uh, corporate discussions for the past four or five decades. They came out with a sentence, I, don't, I hope you can read it, with each of our individual companies serves its own corporate purpose, we share a fundamental commitment to all of our stakeholders to customers, employees, suppliers, communities, then shareholders. Well, that's kind of amazing. That is saying that the shareholder is only one of five or six important constituents in the life of the firm, and they're, they're putting it last. So this led to a lot of discussion. Is this, are they serious about this, or is this a piece of public relations? And if it is public relations, why do they feel a necessity to do this as the, as the principal uh, CEOs of corporations in America. The Wall Street Journal editorial page, which is very conservative, went after them and criticized them for this. Remember, I found this interesting because my view of how the politics of all this work is, is capitalists fighting capitalists is to me a, a lot of the way things work. You have different factions and fragments of capitalists fighting each other. And so I find that interesting. The Wall Street Journal attacked uh, the business roundtable for this as a violation of Milton Friedman's famous statement in 1970, the job of the firm is to make money within the confines of the law. And that he goes on to, and it's the shareholders who own the company. Uh, recent research on this says that the companies that sign, the CEOs who sign this document have actually not changed their behavior very much, which would make us think that this is public relations. Another interesting thing that's happened is that uh, there have been more shareholder fights. So you would think that these stuff, this, what's the matter with the system? What, you know, the, uh, the diffuse shareholder model. Well, why can't shareholders fight for things they believe in? You believe that the firm ought to behave in a particular way. The one class I'm still teaching at UCSD is on corporate social accountability. And I asked students, uh, something about the firm that bothers you, uh, what can you do about it? And one of the techniques is that you can buy shares in a firm or you can belong to an organization do that. You go to stockholders meeting and you can complain. So we analyze, is that plausible or is that a, is that a completely naive view that you can get anything done that way? And then the world being what it is, whenever I teach this class, something useful happens in the world. And the week that that topic was up was the week that there was an article in the paper that Costco shareholders had successfully defeated three of the directors of Costco for not being tough enough on coming out with a climate plan, on evaluating what were the risk elements for the firm and climate change models that were going on. I said, wow, that's really amazing that, this, that they had mobilized enough votes. You remember how this works, every share is a vote. And so in order to defeat the shareholders, you have to mobilize enough votes to win at a shareholders meeting. And uh, they had done that. Now, that's kind of a, you know, a positive sign. Then I read the day before yesterday preparing this, that Carl Icahn challenged McDonald board for not honoring a commitment they had made to him on cruelty to caged pigs. And 
I thought to myself, hmm, I don't know what I feel about that. Is that really so important? So what I've seen is that you have um, you have some successful some successful shareholder led fights. Not a lot of them, very small number, but overwhelming. They are, they are on environment issues. Very few of them on our issues of equality, uh, excessive corporate pay, bad working conditions, uh, uh, social justice. Very few happen on that. It's very hard to mobilize people for that. Um, I had hoped that the shareholder, when I first started to work on this, I had hoped that the shareholder movement, I'd hoped that institutional investors would be a way of overcoming the collective action problem. Because after all, who are institutional investors? They include, so if any of you have TIA, CREF, that's an institutional investor. CalPERS is an institutional investor. Vanguard is an institutional investor. I thought, well, you know, they are in a position to do something and around the world, those organizations are doing things, are fighting crony capitalism and demanding uh, shareholder protections. But as I started to read it, I, I discovered, I started to understand that there's more variety amongst institutional investors that I had realized. And I had discovered that most people in this field who I think I thought knew far more than I did, I just was kind of shocked at how few people seem to be aware of the differences amongst institutional investors. For example, most institutional investors never revealed how they voted their proxies. They, and most institutional investors voted with management. You know, they owned all these shares, so they just voted whatever management asked them to do. So that was one of the controversies that finally got through. So Donaldson, who was a Republican, who was head of the SEC, tried to force them to divulge how they voted and ran into very sharp opposition from some of the institutional investors as well as the corporate CEOs who didn't want that. So I try to show that there's kind of a quite a lot of complicated back and forth on the politics of this. And I discovered that there's a very big difference between Vanguard, TIA, CREF, and CalPERS on the one side and Fidelity and Merrill Lynch on the other side. And what is that? Vanguard, TIA, Kreft, and all of this are owned by you as an investor, whereas Fidelity and Merrill Lynch, they have a separate level of owners. There's a private family that owns Fidelity. They make money off of you. They do not have the same interests at heart. They do not have your interests at heart. They're in conflict with you. So they're not out there lobbying for the protection of minority shareholders like you. They're not. Not in the same way that Vanguard or TI Gref or Calpers are. And but then none of this should make anybody think that your your money is not safe, because I know every many people have a lot of money in Vanguard. But they're not, when these issues come up, they're not doing that. There was a whole fight. I don't have time, so I'm gonna speed this up. But I, one thing I'm going to say, your pension fund, there was a fight that George Bush II proposed to privatize Social Security. Why is that? Because the, this industry would make a huge amount. Imagine if all that money was in private hands, they would be making money off of fees. Okay, and who was the leader who led that effort to push on privatized Social Security? The Johnson family of fidelity. It ran up against a buzz of opposition, so they dropped it. But that, to me, shows an example of how they how they differ. So um, that that's what I discovered is that there are actually bigger differences than you would realize. Well, I have some more points to make on this, but I'm gonna since I'm running out of my 45 minutes, I want to leave want to leave some time. Um, there's um, uh, let's just let me what. What could be done, I think, uh, in reform? I think it could be more done with greater transparency to get companies and institutional investors to be clearer on how they vote on substantive issues. And uh, I think there could be a stronger clawback system that the, the pay system, you know, one of the shocking things is that in order to uh, bring the incentives of uh, executives in line with the incentives of the shareholder, there was this idea, why not we, why don't we pay the executives and shares? Well, that sounded good, but then the executives then acquired an interest in manipulating share prices. 
and they have, wind up having a divergence of interest with the ordinary shareholders. Well, what if we had a clawback model that you couldn't cash in except over a, a quite a long period of time so that if the company lost money, you would have to pay some of that back. And if there were greater voices for, um, for, uh, for employees, fair unionization rules. So um, let me finish by saying, I, I, my theme in all this is that when I started reading about the, the comparative thing, I became convinced that the corporate governance things, the things that allowed the companies to interact in different ways really were a very important difference in how the capitalist economies differed from each other. And that this was, I, in my opinion, insufficiently, it remains insufficiently understood. And that is, that is actually to me as important or more important than this idea that the ministries go around and they pick winners. I don't think that that is as important as this other system because it's this other system that gives incentives for how companies interrelate to each other. That said, my final slide is there are not all the ills that we see in corporations have to do with corporate governance. You know, a lot of ills have to do with tax policy, uh, offshoring or carried interest forward, carried interest on capital gains or campaign contributions, uh, bad policy on monopolies and oligopolies and a whole series of things. But anyway, that is my take, as they say on PBS, that is my spectacular take on, <laughs> on, the, uh, on the importance of corporate governance as a, an important dimension in how market economies differ from each other. And Susan, so I think I'll stop and see if there's a few minutes for questions. All right, thank you so much, Peter. That was really fascinating. Let's go ahead and dive into questions.